Um, in addition, uh, the whole reason the Sea Otter issue, uh, board members, is before you is that the Southeast RAC has been um, dealing with this, this issue for over for quite a while, and they wanted the board to hear this presentation to provide the information on the Sea Otters and, and the issues around the Southeast. Um, this was inserted into this agenda, and we recognize that the extraterritorial jurisdiction is an issue that's going to take a lot of time. And so this is an information opportunity. Um, I don't believe we're going to have public testimony on sea otters, but an opportunity to share that information with you as board members. And Ms. Laverne Smith uh, from Fish and Wildlife Service, there's some other opportunities that are coming up shortly um, dealing with sea otters that uh, um, also the uh, opportunity to deal with. So I want to turn the mic over to you. Laverne, let's go ahead and get your introduction. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And the Fish and Wildlife Service thanks everyone for the opportunity to update the, the board and the RAC and the public on sea otters this morning. We've been trying to have as much dialogue as possible in various forums in Southeast to discuss sea otters and the concerns in Southeast Alaska relative to management of the otters. So um, we're going to continue to do that. This will just be one of many forums where we're trying to update folks and, um, and get, you know, ideas and work in a collaborative way with all the different affected um, parties. Um, I think when Marina talks this morning, she'll talk about some of the additional workshops and things that are planned for the future. So there'll be lots of additional opportunity to talk about sea otters, um, you know, in other forums as well as um, the update this morning. This morning we have um, Marina Gill from our Marine Mammal Program who's going to do the presentation on the, um, the biology and the update on how we're trying to work with the different parties to um, you know, manage sea otters. And then Stan Prusinski, our special agent in charge for Alaska, is going to be here to cover some of the enforcement issues. So I'm going to turn it over to Marina and Stan and um, we appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And I, I do have one more short um, announcement. After this presentation, we're going to take about a 10 minute break. It's going to take about 10 minutes to switch um, uh, electronic equipment uh, to continue our um, discussion on Kutsumu's uh, petition. So after this presentation, we'll take a short break while they uh, change the equipment. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank Laverne for the introduction, um, Mr. Chair and the Board for inviting Fish and Wildlife Service to present this information. My name is Verena Gill, as Laverne said, and I've lived in Alaska for 24 years and I've been lucky enough to raise my five-year-old daughter here and I absolutely just really love this state and um, excited for the opportunity to work with partners on this issue. Can, if ever, can you all see or would you like the lights dimmed a little? We have that ability. If you want, I want to introduce the other people. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Stan Brzezinski, as Laverne said. I'm the special agent in charge for the Fish and Wildlife Service for the Alaska region. Mr. Chairman, good morning. My name is Phil Darby. I'm from Ketchikan, Alaska. I'm uh, the executive director of the Southeast Alaska Regional Dive Fisheries Association. And uh, after Rena gives her uh, presentation, I'll give a short presentation on the, uh, uh, the dive fisheries in Southeast Alaska and the impact uh, uh, the sea otters are having on our fisheries in Southeast. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kathy Needham, and I represent the Southeast Regional Advisory Council. And this morning, after the presentations that you hear, I'm going to give a summary of um, Southeast RAC uh, considerations regarding sea otters that we've heard over the years. Thank you. Welcome. So I'm going to talk to you about um, sea otter recolonization and the management actions Fish and Wildlife Service um, are taking in Southeast Alaska. Outline of the presentation, I'm first going to talk to you about the history of sea otters in Southeast Alaska, some of the management actions the agency is taking, and some of the applied research that we're um, involved with. Just to give you an overview on the stock structure of sea otters in Alaska, there are three stocks. The southeast stock, um, it runs from Cape Yakutaga down to um, the border with Canada. The south central stock, uh, the lion 
for that divides down Cook Inlet and then the Southwest Stock. The Southwest Stock is the only one of the three stocks that is uh, listed under the Endangered Species Act. It's listed as threatened. The South Central and Southeast Stocks are not listed under the Endangered Species Act. Their protection lies under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So moving on specifically to Southeast Alaska. Prior to the fur trade, sea otters ranged from northern Japan all the way up to Russia along the Aleutians of, throughout the southern coast of Alaska and actually all the way down to Baja, Mexico. And they're uh, estimated to be between 200 to 300,000 sea otters prior to the fur trade. After the fur trade, there were um, just 11 remnant colonies less left throughout their original range and none of these remnant colonies were left in southeast. <coughs> sea otters had been completely extirpated from southeast Alaska. But between 1965 and 1969, the state of Alaska, the Department of Fishing and Game, decided that they wanted to recolonize southeast Alaska. And so they removed um, 400, about 400 sea otters from some of the remaining remnant colonies in uh, the Aleutians and Prince William Sound and took these 400 otters to six sites in southeast Alaska. So um, since that time there have been several surveys of their numbers. The, the last um, wide range survey was 2002 and 2003 that was conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey. But in response to um, some of the comments we had been receiving from the public and our stakeholders that sea otters had really been increasing in southeast, we conducted a, a stock-wide survey of the entire southeast stock in 2010 and 2011. Um, I was the one that personally flew the survey, and I flew southern southeast Alaska, which is pretty much from Cape Petersburg down to um, Cape Shackham in 2010, and in 2011 I, I flew um, Admiralty Baranoff up to Glacier Bay uh, last summer. And each uh, survey took about a month each, so two months worth of, of flying at 150 foot, um, at 100 mile an hour, uh, lots of transects across bays, um, counting otters, and, and we don't just um, come up with a population estimate by counting the otters that we see, we actually have a correction factor for the otters that we would have missed. So we fly along, see otter, and then and correct for how many we would have missed by flying a circle around and saying, okay, there were three diving that I would have missed, so I multiply that by three. So this is an estimate of the population, but it, it isn't just uh, the number that I saw. So first in northern southeast Alaska, um, I estimated since the last survey in 02 there had been a 4% per year increase and in southern southeast uh, a 12% per year increase since the survey in 2003 and how that translates is that uh, the, the survey in 02 and 03 um, estimated there were 10,563 otters and the survey that I completed the past two years I estimated there were 19,989 Otters, so you know, from 10 and a half to 20,000. And just a, a quick note about the growth rates, the four and the 12%, that also mirrors what they saw in the 2002 and 2003 survey, that otters in southern southeast Alaska are increasing at a faster rate than those in the north. Um, we're not quite sure, but I would suspect it's just available forage and available um, habitat. There is a lot more shallow, uh, Area that otters like to uh, they they like to dive at about 100 100 foot and below um, for their food and a lot of places for example along Amalty it's a very narrow band at that depth. Again, a note on the uh, growth rate otters in areas in other areas where they're recolonizing um, increase at 20 to 22 percent per year. So you know even though we're seeing a, a big increase and we are seeing a lot of otters in southeast, they're not growing as fast as they they could be. Um, and I wanted to just compare the densities of, of sea otters in southeast and compare them to other areas, just looking at, and this addresses the question of carrying capacity. So the bars on the left in the blue represent other areas in Alaska, Kenai Fjords National Park, Kachemak Bay, Kodiak, and, and Western Prince William Sound. And the bars on the right are areas in southeast Alaska. 
And so you can see that in general, uh, otters in southeast Alaska are at lower densities. There are fewer otters per square kilometer than there are in other places, which suggests to us that they have not yet reached carrying capacity uh, or optimal sustainable population. Now we've talked about numbers, let's talk about range expansion. There was an aerial survey done in 87 and 89, and um, that's on the far left. And um, compare that to the 2002-2003 aerial survey. And you can see that the, the blue areas represent areas of expansion. So down uh, around the Barrier Islands, they expanded um, the Morel Islands and up by Cake um, when, they, when you compare 87 to 2002. And then the far right graph shows the um, range expansion during the survey that I conducted. And again, those same areas, Cape, they've moved up to Admiralty now, and it increased um, around the barriers, and, and they've moved upward uh, to actually meet up with the Morel Island population. There's been no range expansion in northern southeast Alaska since the late 80s, but definitely all the growth, range expansion, number increases, all been in southern southeast Alaska. And uh, just a closer look at that, the two black circles represent what otters were released in 1968. There were 55 released at the Barrier Islands and 51 at the Morel Islands. And the area encompassed by the red polygon represents the uh, range of otters in 1988. Um, the area encompassed by the green polygon represents uh, the range expansion that occurred between 88 and 2003. And then the orange polygon represents the further range expansion that I saw when I flew the surveys in 2010 in southern southeast. So now you can see there um, along the southern edge of Admiralty up Cake and all the way down there to Cape Shackham. So moving on to um, resource conflicts. Otters do change the ecosystem. Um, an ecosystem with otters is kelp dominated. You get a lot of um, herring and, and uh, kelp a dependent fish, but an ecosystem without otters is urchin and macron vertebrate dominated. They are a, a keystone species, so they definitely change the ecosystem, um, and they really do maintain um, a lot of cascading, a, a lot of, um, maintain the structure of the com ecological community, and if they're present or absent, it really changed the ecosystem. And so it suggests that you really do need to look at ecosystem-based management, just not single species management. So some of the things that the Fish and Wildlife have been doing in response to um, the public and our stakeholders' concerns about this increasing um, number of sea otters in southeast impacting subsistence resources and commercial resources. We're trying to clarify hunting regulations um, so that people are, are not uh, afraid to hunt, they know the regulations, and we're hoping to actually get a guidebook out to um, get into the communities so that it's very clear who can hunt and the regulations associated with that. And I'm going to talk about all of these more in a little detail. Um, we've drafted some guidance, um, and we plan a co-management workshop to address the significantly altered interpretation. We've been conducting government-to-government -government consultations on co-management with um, some of the tribes. Um, we're looking at protecting sensitive resource areas through local management plans with our native partners. Um, we're open to all sorts of ideas such as maybe acoustic deterrents to see otters um, in areas that are sensitive. And then we've also been conducting collaborative research to collect the data that we need to make uh, future management decisions. So I'm going to go over um, each of these one by one. And this first one on Seattle hunting regulations, I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, Stan. Again, good morning. My name is Stan Przezinski with the law, Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, as we talk about uh, hunting regulations for, the, uh, for, uh, for sea otters, um, step back and, and realize that the uh, sea otters and other marine mammals in Alaska, walrus and polar bear, are protected by the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, under that, uh, all take, uh, including uh, harvest, is, uh, is prohibited, except for uh, the take of marine mammals for uh, subsistence and making of, uh, of handicraft by, uh, by Indians, Aleuts, and Eskimos who reside in Alaska. So when Verena talks about uh, the hunting regulations, uh, they're really um, 
it's fairly open in that uh, the harvest is, is open. There's no bag limits. There's no harvest limits and there's no methods and means restrictions. So when, when you look at the uh, you know, Alaska Department of Fish and Game Regulation book that's in talk about uh, uh, you know, what can you do or what you can do, that's very proscriptive and it's very detailed and there's dozens and dozens of pages of, of what can be done and what can't be done. When we talk about the harvest of uh, sea otters, there really isn't that many regulations. The only two that are important is one, that they're not taken in a wasteful manner and two, that the harvest is reported to the Fish and Wildlife Service within 30 days. Those are the two regulations. Where the Fish and Wildlife Service Office of Law Enforcement uh, again gets uh, uh, itself in this issue is dealing with um, handicraft. And the board knows very well uh, the difficulties in trying to identify and define handicraft and significantly altered a couple of years ago when you dealt with uh, handicraft and bear parts. Very similar, language is very similar. We talked about significantly altered. Um, and what does that mean? Uh, for a native uh, uh, artisan or harvester that has taken a sea otter legally, for them to sell it to a non-native, it has to be turned into a handicraft. And by definition, that includes significantly altered from its original form. So the sale of sea otter parts is illegal. You can't sell a part. In our view, a pelt is a part. It has to be transformed into something else, and that's transformation is into a handicraft. So therein lies the rub and lies a lot of the issue is what is the level of alteration? What does significant mean? We all have our in our own mind's eye what significant means, but when you put that on paper or when you put that on the table, what does that really mean? So our idea is that it has to be altered in such a way that it's no longer a pelt, it's no longer a, a trophy, it's no longer um, uh, easily transformed back into that pelt. So we're looking at, you know, the level of change to make it in, uh, a pelt to a, to a handicraft. There's been a lot of discussion as to how we deal with that. We understand that there are some uh, uh, interpretation issues with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and uh, National Marine Fisheries Service. There are some, some differences there. Uh, we also realize that you know, the species that we are, we, uh, are responsible for uh, are different. And again, trying to make this very general term significantly altered fit everything from, from whales to sea otters uh, in southeast is, is difficult, and we're, uh, and as Verena said, we're, uh, we're, we're trying to work with, with that, uh, the group and other partners to, uh, to clarify that. Um, th there has been a lot of discussion, I understand, yesterday and in the last couple of days about enforcement action by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I've been doing this since uh, 1990, 91. And our focus, uh, even back then, has is, is, is tried not to be dealing with significantly altered. Our, our focus of enforcement has, has, uh, has tried to uh, be harvest by non-eligible participants, non-native harvest. Um, we've uh, worked several cases here in the last couple of years where we, uh, we targeted uh, non-natives who were harvesting. And also the sale of unaltered. Uh, sea otter pelts. That's, that's been another issue for us. Uh, there has been a lot of information about hides being sent overseas, smuggled out of the country uh, for, uh, to furriers and, and other people in, in, the, in other countries who want raw pelts to make their own handicraft, to make their own clothing for resale. So that's been another target of ours is, is actually the sale of unaltered uh, handicraft so we wouldn't have to get into the the, the fine detail of what is significantly altered and what is not as we work through this process to try to clarify it and try to make sure that everybody, both the regulated public and the regulators understand what we're, we're talking about. So, so in essence, and, and the third one is to help uh, Verena and her folks is that uh, we've been trying to help uh, her increase compliance with the 30-day tagging requirement. Uh, as I said earlier, that's one of the only restrictions on it is that uh, the harvest has to be reported to the service within 30 days to help her and her biologists and, and help her, uh, 
figure out where the, the population is going. So, so those have actually been the three main focuses of our enforcement efforts uh, in Southeast uh, for quite some time. Thank you, Sam. So talking about harvest of sea otters by um, natives in Southeast, <clears throat> it actually is trending towards increasing. On average, uh, since 1990, 353 otters were taken per year, and this is just in Southeast Alaska. Um, the last two years, 2009, uh, 2010, I suppose it's not the last two years, but the last two years we have data for, um, because a lot of our certs are still coming into the office for 2011. Um, the harvest has been um, six, over 600 otters um, in 09 and 10, and um, that from the tags that we're getting in in 2011, it's going to look closer to 1,000 otters in southeast Alaska um, alone, and um, on average, it's just been, it, it has been 600 otters per year across the whole state. So what was usual for the whole state is now what the harvest numbers that we're seeing in southeast. So harvest is definitely increasing. So let's move to significantly altered. Um, we did draft guidance um, to address the significantly altered interpretation. And in fact, I did leave some, um, we sent some letters out to all of the native tribes within the range of sea otters in the state. And I have copies of those letters on the back table if anyone is interested in looking. Um, and it had draft language on an um, interpretation of significantly altered. We're asking um, stakeholders to give us comments on that draft guidance. And those comments are due by the 31st of March to our office. And again, that information is on those letters, if the letters are all gone, please contact someone from Fish and Wildlife Service here or, or myself. I'll be happy to send you a copy of that letter. And we really are looking forward to looking at the comments um, helping us shape that interpretation. Another avenue that um, we're taking with the significantly altered language, language is that we're going to be cooperating with um, the Indigenous Peoples Council on Marine Mammals as a part of our co-management um, agreement. We're hoping to hold a workshop um, to exchange information and have 30 to 40 hunters and handicraft producers attend the meeting in Anchorage. And one of the uh, big topics of that meeting will be to address the significantly altered interpretation. We're going to ask um, the hunters and handicraft producers for input on how to clarify significantly altered um, definition and to help us with language they feel comfortable with that addresses their concerns. So there are two avenues to have input on that particular issue. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, is now conducting government to government consultations um, with tribes in the, the range of sea otters. And in 2011, we sent a letter to all of the tribes within the sea otter range and asked them if they would like to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service on co-management. 16 tribes responded that they wanted government to government consultations with us. Seven of those tribes, uh, seven of the 16 were from Southeast Alaska. So far we've consulted with nine tribes, four in Southeast. Uh, we did that in 2011. Um, we will begin uh, to reinitiate government to government here within the next few weeks with the remaining seven tribes. Um, but this isn't the end of our government to government relationship. This is just on one issue, on co-management. So um, after, uh, if any dry tribe wishes to consult on any issue, they just need to get a hold of us and we'll be responsive to all requests for government to government consultation on any issue, including the co-management issue. This was just the beginning of the process. Also, local management plans. We're really encouraging tribes to develop their own management plans because they do have the ability to manage uh, sea otter populations. And we're available uh, to help um, and uh, consult the tribes and provide technical and legal advice if that is needed. Um, for example, maybe you want to uh, have um, information from the survey that I flew uh, on where otters seem to be in your particular area. Um, maybe you just need some um, biological advice and we're happy to help. Um, so just contact us and we are um, hoping to just encourage more of the management plans and I know there's some effort on Prince Wales Island for example to really get that going this year. And then uh, finally we've been conducting collaborative research uh, to help us inform uh, our decisions. Uh, we did receive some money from the North Pacific Research Board 
um, as well as Sea Grant and Fish and Wildlife also sponsored this research and, and Phil's organization, Southeast Regional Dive Fishers Association, and Petersburg Vessels Only Association also helped um, to fund um, this project to look at the impact of sea otter recolonization on uh, commercial fisheries in Southeast Alaska. So I'm just going to run through uh, quickly a few of those results. And um, the main person doing this research, he's in this photo here, is Zach White. He's a PhD student in Juneau, and he's Professor Ginny Eckert. Um, and uh, they are um, going to be continuing the project with us and Sea Grant here for the next two or three years. So there were four components to this research. The aerial survey of the stock, um, that was mostly the fish and wildlife part of this, and we did conduct that and finish that project last year. Um, we're looking at foraging ecology and the movement and survival of sea otters. Uh, we captured and put radios in sea otters on the edge of their um, range. And then uh, we want to look at uh, the impact of sea otters on the fisheries using fish and game uh, catch statistics. And again, this is all commercial fisheries rather than subsistence. So just quickly onto the foraging aspect. <coughs> Zach and his uh, team of volunteers have been out uh, for the past two years in southern southeast, and you probably recognize this figure from um, my range expansion slide a few slides ago. And uh, they've been to seven sites uh, over the last two years, sites that otters recently have moved into, and sites like the Barrier Islands, where otters have been since 1969, to compare foraging between those areas. So there's seven sites, and they've looked at uh, over 3,000 foraging dives, and. Um, examined 350 uh, pounds of biomass that have been consumed by otters. So this is a, a preliminary diet composition um, <coughs> pie chart. And um, the uh, pie represented by red is the commercially um, important species. And the pie in blue is the subsistence species, this section anyway. Um, and this is actually, this. This graph is a little, I wouldn't say misrepresented, but you can see that red urchins make up 38% of that pie. So it looks, it looks like all that sea otters are doing are eating red urchins. And actually what happened was that uh, they went down to um, the outer coast of Doll Island. Um, and otters, when I surveyed there in 2010, hadn't yet reached uh, far down the island. And there was a good red sea urchin, um, a lot of good beds still intact. And in the time that uh, I had finished that survey, between then and when they went down last summer, sea otters had moved into the region, and they were eating 99% red urchin because they were easy to get. And so when they were doing their foraging watches, that's all they saw them eating red urchin. So it sort of skewed it a little bit. So that's why we have commercial species. Um, otters eat 57% of commercially important species if you include the red urchins. But if you, don't, if you take the red urchins out, because that sort of was an aberration for one site that heavily weighted the data, it's about 19%. Um, but 41% uh, of their diet is uh, important subsistence species. But this is all seven sites. Now, there are differences if you then break it down to sites where otters recently moved into compared to sites where they've been since the 60s. And basically, the story there is if they've been there a long time, they're mostly eating clams. And then um, they're not eating commercially important species. Of course, clams are important to subsistence, uh, persistence uses. But they're predominantly eating clams. But if you look in an area where they just moved into, they're eating the easy, high fat, high calorie stuff like Dungeness crab and um, sea duck and gooey duck clam. Um, once they've eaten those, they don't move on. Um, as we're, you know, we're seeing with our radios, they don't actually move on and go decimate somewhere else. They stay and they just switch their diets to clams. And then other populations will move on to areas with um, these big, uh, large macroinvertebrate species that are still intact. So what happens is they just switch prey. So our movement study, we tagged 30 otters um, just outside of Cake. We did that in um, Keiku Straits, Saginaw, and Security Bays. Uh, 16 males, 14 females, and we wanted to see what they were eating and if they were going to move beyond the edge of the range because they had just moved into that area the year before. And that will be ongoing for the next two years. We have um, planes flying once a week looking for these otters. Um, here's a, a map showing with the uh, circle, uh, the stars, excuse me, where we uh, captured otters, and then the circles show where they have moved. 
and you can see some of marauders have already moved over to the southern edge of um, Admiralty and out to Pinter Rocks and actually a little bit beyond towards um, Petersburg. So they are moving around. We also find big differences in the winter. Um, they are uh, stacked up in Saginaw and Security Bay. Um, you'll get rafts of 600 or so in those bays and then in the summer they will disperse out. So uh, um, Phil and Kathy and a few of us have sort of formed a working group the past couple of years and um, this slide comes from a meeting that we had in January, in Juneau actually. Some of the research that we thought was needed um, in the future, looking at the other roles of sea otters in the ecosystem in maintaining the kelp forest. Um, are there positive fishery impacts? For example, is the herring fishery, um, will that improve? For example, in Sitka, where there have been otters for a long time and they've cultivated this kelp, uh, will those fisheries increase and are there positive impacts to tourism? Um, other areas without otters that are suitable for habitat, um, for otter habitat and allowing us to predict where they'll expand, which will maybe help people plan. Um, uh, we believe there needs to be um, an estimate of the standing stock by a massive Dungeness crab in the region. Nobody really has a handle on that. Um, looking at the areas most impacted, uh, the subsistence areas most impacted by sea otter recolonization, because a lot of the work so far has been commercial oriented. Um, changes in the fishery, looking at the compression of Dungeness fleet because the, the uh, fishery is com being compressed into areas where otters are not in order to make the uh, catch viable. And then looking at otter distribution abundance prior to the fur trade and also looking at shellfish um, abundance at that time. This is my contact information if anyone wishes to get a hold of me. Um, and uh, of course uh, Laverne and Pete will be here for the remaining of, uh, remainder of the meeting and Jerry as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I know we don't have very much time for questions here, but um, contact me. Uh, contact me if you're interested in government to government consultation. Um, Stan, do you have anything that you want to add? Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Phil Doherty from the Southeast Regional Dive Fisheries Association, and I'll, I'll run the slideshow okay. for you. Thank you, Marina. And uh, again, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I introduce myself. Uh, my name is Phil Doherty. I'm from Ketchikan, Alaska. I'm the executive director of the Southeast Alaska Regional Dive Fisheries Association. And uh, we find ourselves in, in a position here where uh, oftentimes uh, commercial fisheries and subsistence fisheries uh, uh, work against each other. And I'm sure this board and, and a lot of the people here um, are wondering why commercial fisheries uh, is going to be presented at this meeting here. Well, because what we harvest in our dive fisheries, and, and I'll be speaking mostly to the dive fisheries uh, because that's what I represent, uh, but uh, I, I won't be going into a lot of the Dungeness crab fisheries information, but the Dungeness crab fisheries uh, both the subsistence and the commercial harvest in Southeast Alaska is being greatly impacted by the uh, sea otters. To give you a little bit of a background on the association, we're a very unique association in Alaska. We're the only uh, commercial fisheries that it was formed by legislative that um, the divers have to pay an assessment on their ex vessel value. Uh, the gooey duck divers uh, pay 7% of the ex vessel value of their uh, product. Sea cucumbers, they pay 5% of the ex vessel value for red sea urchins, again, 7%. Uh, that money goes back into the state of Alaska, so the state of Alaska can manage and research uh, these three dive fisheries. Um, the money that's left over uh, comes back into the association uh, so that we can go forward and do the things that we need to do within, within an association. Um, the fisheries itself started in the uh, mid to late 1980s. Um, 
And when the department realized at that time that these fisheries were going to be growing, they kind of put the brakes on the fisheries, and that's when the fishermen went to the state legislature and formed this association. And that's when the Alaska Department of Fish and Game started to really actively manage these fisheries. Um, my background, I was the area management uh, in the Ketchikan area during that time. So um, I've seen this fishery start from, uh, there was no fisheries when I first started working for the fishing department in 1978. And now uh, this year, uh, the, the uh, gooey duck fishery and the sea cucumber fishery will probably have an ex-vessel value of somewhere around 15 to 20 million dollars in Southeast Alaska. So it's become the most important commercial fisheries in the wintertime in Southeast Alaska. I'm not sure how many folks in this room know what these dive fisheries are about, so my next series of slides will just be a show you what, uh, uh, what we're harvesting out there and what we're competing against on the sea otters. Uh, the Gouda clam is the largest burrowing clam on, on the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it, there's Gouda clam fisheries in Washington State, uh, British Columbia, and, and now in Alaska. They're about two and a half pounds a piece. Uh, they're sold on the live market. Uh, that's where the value lays. Uh, most of the product ends up going to Hong Kong. They're harvested in about 30 to 40 feet of water. Uh, we work very closely with the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation on water quality work and on PSP testing. Uh, without, uh, if we don't pass PSP tests, the uh, gooey ducks do not get harvested. The other important fisheries is the sea cucumber fishery. Uh, these animals uh, mostly occur in the 30 to 40 uh, foot uh, depth, uh, very vulnerable to uh, the sea otters. Uh, they're the second most impacted fisheries that we have besides the sea urchin fishery. Sea cucumbers are harvested. Uh, there's five longitudinal mussels within inside the sea, uh, sea cucumber. Again, they're largely an Asian market for these things. The meat is sold and then the uh, skin of the sea Cucumber is dried and sold largely on the Chinese market. Sea urchin fisheries is, is used for the, uh, for the row, uh, and as Rena said, the uh, sea urchin population is impacted uh, first and, uh, and greatly by the uh, sea otters, and the easiest thing for the sea otters to eat. And here's just a picture of um, a sea urchin being brought to the dock at Ketchikan, and uh, they'll be opened up, the row will be harvested from them, and again, it's largely an Asian market for the uh, sea otter row, uh, the uni. As you can see, the, these fisheries that have grown in value, especially the gooey duck fishery and the uh, sea cucumber fishery. Uh, the sea urchin fishery right now in Southeast Alaska is at a very low level due to uh, world markets and uh, the inability to compete with a large Russian harvest of uh, sea urchins in the last several years. But we've gone uh, from an next vessel value down to uh, one, two million dollars uh, to the 2009-2010 season where we had an next vessel value of uh, five million dollars. This was based on an next vessel value of about uh, four to five dollars uh, for the gooey duck clam. This year uh, gooey duck clams, uh, a couple, for the couple of openings that uh, uh, recently had, have been selling at $22 a pound on the market. So this year our ex vessel value of the fisheries uh, could very well be 15 to 20 million dollars depending if we can harvest all of our guideline harvest levels. We are having some problems with the PSP levels in Southeast Alaska but uh, we're still testing and we uh, anticipate harvesting as much as we can. So. Again, the value of these fisheries has gone up uh, incredibly high and making them a very important fisheries, uh, especially on the west coast of Prince of Wales uh, to uh, towns like Craig and Kowak. <coughs> the sea cucumber fishery again has uh, increased uh, quite a bit, uh, up to uh, $4 million ex vessel value. Uh, this was based on the last few years of about $3 or $3.50 a pound. This year, uh, sea cucumbers were being sold at $6.50 a pound mm -hmm. on the market. So again, we're going to see an ex vessel value in Southeast Alaska of around $15 million uh, for sea cucumbers. 
The uh, yellow line is the guideline harvest level that the Alaska Department of Fish and Game has come up with. And you can see over the last few years that we're starting to see a decline in our guideline harvest levels. And we've lost uh, quite a number of areas that have been closed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game uh, due to sea otter predation. So uh, both gooey duck clams and the sea cucumber fisheries are, have kind of reached their peak in terms of the guideline harvest level. And now we're on the downhill side of, uh, of our fisheries. In the areas where the Alaska Department of Fish and Game does its surveys, and they survey all of these uh, species, cucumbers, gooey ducks, and sea urchins prior to uh, allowing us to go in there and harvest. So there's a, a long time uh, of, uh, of the department going in there and doing the assessment work. Uh, and a lot of these areas are now being impacted by the sea otters. 28% of the areas for sea cucumbers are impacted. 66 of the areas are impacted in the gooey duck fishery and 57% of the sea urchin areas are being impacted by sea otters. This is a chart of Southeast Alaska. The red area is where, and, and this is much like the uh, chart that Karina put up earlier, these are the areas that are being impacted by sea otters. Uh, they're also the most productive areas for sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and gooey neck clams in Southeast Alaska. So, we have seen a, uh, a huge increase. Some of the areas have been closed, and we anticipate that those areas will probably never reopen. And as we look down the road, uh, we feel that our fisheries are very much in jeopardy here. Recently, we had a uh, report done uh, for our student McDowell group. Uh, the McDowell group is based here in Juneau. They're a research group. Uh, they go and collect the information and, and report back to us. Uh, the source of their information is the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Mm -hmm. We actually didn't have, uh, my association didn't have much to this, do this report except to, uh, to uh, get the McDowell group started on it. And I won't go through all of this, but the, the, uh, the picture that it uh, is painting is a uh, decrease, uh, economic uh, decrease in the fisheries. Uh, for sea cucumbers uh, from 1996 to 2011, We've lost uh, approximately 3.2 million pounds of, uh, sea, uh, of sea cucumbers to uh, sea otter predation uh, at, a, at, a, at a value of about $5.3 million. Uh, the estimated wholesale value, which is the ex vessel value plus everything else that's added on to that, the processing, the shipping, uh, paying of uh, tenders and, and people who work in the processing plant, is much closer to $9 million. In total, in the last uh, six to ten years in Southeast Alaska, uh, the McDowell Group estimated that uh, uh, the estimated wholesale value lost to sea otter predation for cucumbers, gooey ducks, urchins, and dungeness crab is over $22 million. This is uh, what we call a snapshot of the fisheries. A uh, number of active divers in this past season uh, was 69 divers. Uh, the average, if you went, all of these fisheries are limited entry. If you were to go buy a limited entry fishery for uh, gooey ducks today, it would cost you a little more over $81,000 to get into the fisheries. The, the uh, permit value, I think, is a reflection of the, was a reflection of the health of the fisheries. It'll be interesting to see how that permit value uh, changes here over the next several years. Uh, the average, uh, the last uh, season that we had, the 2010-2011 season, was a $5.9 million ex vessel value. That was based on $6.67 a pound uh, for gooey ducks. This year, as I said earlier, uh, we've reached that upwards of $20, uh, $22 a pound uh, for uh, gooey duck clams. <coughs> and this is again a, a snapshot of the sea cucumber fishery. A lot more divers participate in the uh, sea cucumber fishery. Uh, the last season, 180 divers were in the water. Uh, to buy into the fisheries uh, just to get the permit would be a little over $11,000. Uh, in the last year, we harvested 1.27 million pounds of, uh, of sea cucumbers for an ex-vessel value of 3.4 million pounds. That was based on $2.65 a pound. This year, we're seeing an ex-vessel value of uh, $6.50 a pound. So the ex-vessel value is going to go up by about three times. Um, okay. <coughs> Again, just, just showing what we've lost for the ex vessel value and the loss of the communities of divers and the people that participate in any portion of these fisheries, uh, is, it continues to grow. Uh, we're losing uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds 
of, uh, of sea otters, uh, excuse me, of uh, sea cucumbers, uh, mostly due to uh, predation by sea otters. And, and I'll say that um, all of these figures are available in the McDowell Group report. That report is available on their website and is also available on our website too if, if anyone wants to uh, download the, uh, the uh, uh, total uh, uh, report. Again, we're obviously losing um, uh, gooey duck clams to the sea otters. Um, this last year, the department went out and did some surveys for, uh, for gooey duck clams, and they've estimated that we're going to lose over 140,000 pounds of uh, gooey duck clams to our harvest. These are, that's our total uh, loss of gooey ducks. That's loss of gooey ducks to our harvest, and we harvest on an annual basis about 2% of the gooey duck populations that within the beds in Southeast Alaska. And while our sea urchin fishery, as I said earlier, is not uh, as robust as we'd like to see because of world markets, uh, if and when the world markets will, uh, we can get back into the fisheries, we're going to have lost a tremendous amount of uh, red sea urchins in Southeast Alaska. And actually, if the markets change and we can go back in, we, we may not even have uh, enough sea urchins to conduct the fisheries anymore in Southeast Alaska. In the last 10 years, we've lost, the department has. Uh, Estimated that we have lost about 6.3 million pounds off of our guideline harvest level due to the sea otter predation. <coughs> what the McDowell Group came up with was one of their final uh, uh, reports that, in, in they said, in short, commercial diet fisheries and large populations of sea otters cannot coexist in the same waters. In addition, once the commercially viable biomass of crab and macroinvertebrates such as sea cucumbers and gooey ducks is gone, will likely not return given sustained sea otter predation. And again, as Rena said earlier, there's a tremendous population of hard shell clams in Southeast Alaska that is not used for the commercial fisheries, it's used for subsistence harvest. But once the cucumbers, gooey ducks, sea urchins, and dungeness crab are gone, the otters will stay. And again, in closing, you know, just the face of these, of these fisheries, uh, we've gone from the largest uh, fisheries in Southeast Alaska in the wintertime to potentially in the, in the uh, very foreseeable future, these fisheries will be gone. Uh, they cannot coexist with sea otters. So uh, it helps the communities, uh, divers go to those communities, Craig, Clawak, especially on the West Coast, they tie their boats up there for months, they buy everything in the communities. So, the loss of the dive fisheries in southeast Alaska, especially southern southeast Alaska, is going to have a huge impact on some of these smaller communities. So that's my last slide. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. And uh, again, um, I'll be here. If anyone has any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Good morning again. My name is Kathy Needham. I represent the Southeast Regional Advisory Council, and we've been asked to give an overview of the work that we have done regarding sea otters over the past years. Um, I'd like to mention that this presentation is uh, brief considering the amount of information that we've received as a council. Um, and in addition, it's just slightly modified then from a presentation that Mr. Bangs, a fellow council member, gave at the Board of Fisheries meeting earlier this year. Um, as you know, uh, the management of sea otter population har or the management of sea otter harvest is um, outside the jurisdiction of the Federal Subsistence Board. Um, its harvest of sea otters is provided uh, by ADOCA and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Um, and is managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, resources that sea otters consume uh, are managed by the state of Alaska through commercial fisheries and personal use and subsistence fisheries. Um, I'm sorry, can you go back? <laughs> I gave the nod, but I wanted to mention that um, where the Southeast Regional Advisory Council comes into play is that under Title VIII of ANOCA, we provide a venue and a record for communities throughout Southeast Alaska and individuals to raise concerns regarding subsistence issues that are important to them. Um, and then we often can bring these issues to light uh, with the Federal Subsistence Board and or regulatory agencies such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in this particular case. Thank you. 
Uh, regarding previous work, to the best of our knowledge, no one has actually tried to quantify the impacts that sea otters are having on subsistence resources or personal use users. Um, but we have, but I would like to acknowledge that tribes and local communities have traditional knowledge um, about the impact that sea otters have on resources that are important to them. It just has not been quantified in any kind of study that information may exist out there. Uh, there has also been some work done to quantify the harvest use and need of marine resources that are used by local communities. Uh, this work was it's outdated, but was done through um, household harvest surveys um, that have been uh, looked at to quantify those resources. Again, sea otters don't play into that. It's just information about how important marine resources are to uh, commu local communities and tribal entities. Um, we also would like to acknowledge that Southeast Alaska tribes are working directly with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on issues regarding sea otter populations. This is outside of our venue, of course, and, um, and this is in the form of uh, developing local management plans regarding sea otters. Um, on our records, uh, the issue of the impacts of sea otters to marine resources was first brought to light in 2004 by Dr. Dolly Garza, who was a member of the Southeast Regional Advisory Council at that time, and her concern um, was centered around the diminishing resources in nearshore environments, um, uh, marine invertebrates that sea otter, and she believed that it was in direct competition with uh, sea otters. Since 2004, a lot of the records that we have and the testimony that we've received revolve around two issues that are separate but at the same time interrelated. Uh, the first is the growing population of sea otters and their impacts on resource, the resources that they consume. This is an ecological based concern. And then the second thing that we hear a lot of information on has more to do with the regulatory concerns, and that's the challenges that qualified uh, sea otter harvesters face in uh, being able to take uh, animals out of a population in Southeast. Um, we did a tabulation of all of the um, records from the past meetings since that are online since 2001, and again, uh, the first time it was mentioned on our transcripts was in 2004. Since then, uh, the issue of Seattle's has been brought up 44 times. Um, this, isn't, this doesn't speak to the extent of that. That's just the amount of times that it's been brought to us as an issue. It doesn't quantify or qualify the amount of time that we've spent talking about that issue once it's been brought to our attention. Um, and I'm sorry, I said 44 times, but we've actually heard 64 testimonies, and 44 of those are actually issues that individuals, um, regional advisory council members have brought forth in council reports, uh, sharing information of what they've experienced as well as information that they've brought back from their community in terms of concerns. Um, the, those numbers were what we presented to the Board of Fish earlier this year. I wanted to acknowledge that this, in our meeting these past couple of days, that we've heard six additional testimonies from public members, um, as well as uh, seven Southeast Rock members made comments in uh, the transcripts, which are not part of the original tabulation. Since the spring of 2008, our records also show that the Regional Advisory Council has received regular presentations from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and had dialogue with staff regarding issues um, on sea otters, and that information is also in our transcripts. So I mentioned that there were two main themes of information that we've received, the ecological aspect and the regulatory aspect. So concerns regarding uh, the resources that sea otters consume, the testimony that we've heard and issues that we've talked about is that uh, the subsistence marine resources that are mentioned the most in our transcripts include clams, cockles, crabs, abalone, sea urchin, and sea cucumbers. Um, we've also heard 
the concern that the overabundance of sea otters in nearshore environments are in direct competition to subsistence and personal use users. Um, at, the, at our recent meeting a couple of days ago and in meetings in the past, um, our chairman, Mr. Um, Adams, has uh, given us uh, a story that he's gotten, or shared with us a story that he's gotten from an elder, and that is that historically Seattle populations existed more offshore than nearshore, um, and so that competition was potentially historically less because Seattle populations were uh, not in direct conflict with um, resources that are nearshore and accessible to uh, local communities and um, marine resource harvesters. Um, and then an additional concern that we've heard is the potential that sea otters have uh, for habitat degradation. Uh, this comes from how they, uh, how, how they forage for food and um, disturb the bottom environment. Um, and so there has been testimony that um, people are concerned that uh, as uh, grazers are, primary grazers are being removed from the system, um, uh, algae blooms on the bottom of the sea floor have uh, helped smother it out and reduce the amount of recruitment of new uh, populations of marine invertebrates. Concerns that we've heard regarding the regulatory um, aspect of things can be very comp have been very complex. Um, and there isn't a way to uh, express uh, the amount of and the diversity of uh, testimony that we've heard, especially from Alaska Native tribes in Southeast Alaska. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, the concerns have, can be lumped into two subject areas. The first is local law enforcement and their interpretation of what is significantly altered um, when it comes to harvesting three others. And then the second, uh, we've heard a lot about the ability and or the cost of getting hides uh, tagged and tanned. And to sort of summarize the information that has been presented to the Southeast RAC, uh, this is, these are the actions that we've been able to take since the issue has been brought before us. Um, we have requested, and as I mentioned, we receive reports from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regarding the status of sea otter issues um, that are being addressed in Southeast Alaska, and we've been in, we've had that dialogue at our meeting since 2008, um, and we've raised concerns, uh, the, the concerns that we've heard to the Federal Subsistence Board, we mainly do this in our annual reports um, where we summarize uh, the type of testimony that we get from local communities and subsistence users. And then we've also made specific recommendations regarding regulations of Seattle Harvest by Qualified Alaska Native Subsistence Users to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In April of 2010, we've formed a subcommittee that the council approved some direct recommendations of how to change regulations that might make um, the harvest of sea otters uh, a little easier. And, uh, for, and for instance, one of those uh, recommendations was to address uh, the significantly altered definition of the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, to um, make regulations a little bit easier for subsistence harvesters of sea otters. And uh, I just want to close by saying that, again, this was just an overview. Uh, the records uh, that we have actually incorporate hours worth of testimony. Um, and, you know, when we present a number like, well, we've heard 64 testimonies since 2004, uh, that really doesn't do the justice in terms of uh, how the Southeast Regional Advisory Council um, knows the issue is important throughout our region um, because uh, I didn't do a search or tabulation by every time sea otters was mentioned. I only tabulated one, uh, when we only counted it once and then sea otters may have been mentioned and discussed for half an hour and 
uh, and talk and talked about sixty some odd times just in that one discussion. So um, it's it's important, and I'm sure that we're going to continue to hear testimony from local um, communities and continue to work through the challenges of finding a way to address the issue. And I'd like to close by saying something that I put on the record, and that is um, one of the biggest challenges is we work, we've been, work, uh, we've been working on this issue since 2004, and uh, in the meantime, since 2004, Sea Otters are still doing what Sea Otters do with marine resources, and, um, and so uh, that's gonna continue to happen, and I hope that uh, we can all find uh, solutions, uh, diversity of, a diversity of solutions that can eventually help take care of these issues and problems. Thank you. Are, are those of you in the, um, the public? And we'll we'll go with uh, Mr. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've asked Carrie Sykes from the Clinton High, the Central Council, to join me, and I'm the chairman of the Alaska Native Brotherhood Subsistence Committee. We have over 140 people who participate with us across the region on the subsistence issues. And we have been working on this uh, sea otter business as well. And I think uh, after hearing the presentation you just had, if we could take a few minutes to give you an, a native perspective, uh, that might be uh, a little bit helpful for the board. And we certainly had a dialogue with Iraq yesterday on this matter. And I'd like to make a brief, and uh, with Carrie's assistance, we do have a resolution which we have been working on for a month or two in advance of our tribal assembly meeting is coming up in April. And our effort is to try to get uh, a leadership position, a consensus of opinion, and a mobilization of, of Native people throughout the region and uh, with our resolution. And we'd like to share our resolution with the tribal governments throughout the region and, and the actual hunters and the people who <clears throat> utilize the furs uh, at this time. And we have quite a group out there. So our expression today is just a work in progress, but I think it's important, you know, we, we hear what the government is saying, and certainly they have a lot of initiatives that they're doing, but I'm not quite sure that they're quite working or dialoguing with the people who are, are are involved in this issue, at least in the Native community. And let me give you a few thoughts. One is subsistence is being impacted. Our resources are being impacted by, uh, by the sea otters. It's, it's, uh, it's a very much a concern of the, of the people throughout the region. The second thing after the uh, presentation I just heard this morning, I, I think I'd, I'd be concerned about these fishermen as well. Uh, they're, they're impacting our subsistence resources as well. When you talk about $15 million worth of, worth of benefit here and there, and $4 million here and there, and this product and that product, though they're the same products that we use for subsistence. So we may be needing to look at the conservation management as well, of what they're doing as to whatever the sea otters are doing. But we do have a problem. And uh, the thing about the sea otter business is this. There are a number of risks that, that we as leadership in, in the Native community in our region are looking at. One risk is this. The government doesn't seem to be able to work clearly between the departments and the agencies on creating some definitions of how we can use the sea otter pelt products. And uh, we need to get to the bottom line on that. And it, it can't be that complicated. And I think from the <clears throat> records that I'm reading and the, uh, uh, the, the people that we're talking to who are working with the sea mammal thing uh, at their meetings in the last several months, 
they're telling me that between the Department of Commerce and the Department of U.S. Fish and Wildlife, we ought to be able to come to an understanding on, on how the Native people can use uh, the sea otter pelts and the handicapped products uh, that, 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 that they're lawfully allowed to make. And I'm hopeful that we can come to a conclusion on that. You know, the government has this indeterminable process of meetings and uh, on and on and on, you know, and it can't be that complicated uh, to be able to sit down and work with our people to figure out, you know, what, what is significantly altered and how we can make products. We have the notion that we want to be able to make personal products, we want to make handicrafts uh, for our tourism, and we want to work in the, with the fashion industry. And we need to change the thought pattern and whatever regulation or guideline or handybook or whatever the government has to focus in that direction. We believe that uh, we do have a market for these products. Uh, we do believe that we want to have jobs in our communities and we believe that the sea otters can help us uh, uh, contribute to a better economy. So that's one of the thoughts that we have a problem with a problem with and we think we're going to get to an end on this. And maybe with the Native leadership involvement, you know, working with our hunters and our, 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 our handicraft people, we can, we can resolve that issue. The other, the other piece of business that we have a, a problem with is uh, 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 the business of uh, law enforcement. Um, the government speaks to us in two ways. One is a management concern about the hunting and how many sea otters are going to be, need to be hunted and how you handle them to skin them out and tag them and take them to tanneries and you know bring them back and make products with you know the management side I think we can work with but the government dissects or splits their business and they have law enforcement over here and the law enforcement that we've been experiencing at least within the Tongass forest is pretty heavy handed and we, we don't care much for that and uh, they, they're violating the civil rights of our people. They're, they're, they're violating a right that Congress has given us, that we have the ability to hunt these sea otters as native people and make them into handicrafts. Crafts. No other people have that right uh, under the law. But somehow, management program is split from enforcement. We've got to bring this stuff together. We have to make sure that the rules are understood, the practices are understood, what Native people can do in hunting and, uh, and doing the handicrafts is understood not only by the program people who are very undecided right now about what's going on, and uh, then the enforcement people are trying to enforce something that's undecided. And we as Native people see this, uh, see this as a risk. That's why we're not shooting those darn things. Uh, and we need to get a clear understanding of what this law enforcement program is going to be. And, uh, and they, we prefer uh, to have a, a program that's based on education of what the law is and what the enforcement uh, responses will be if people break the law. And I think if we work together, I think we can accomplish that and, and, and eliminate that risk. Uh, the business of, of pelts. We appreciate what Congress has provided to the Alaska Native people in terms of the right to hunt the sea otter and to put them into products. Uh, we're not interested in extending that opportunity to anybody else. We will oppose any law or regulation which says that others may hunt uh, these sea otters. Well, we, we think Congress was wise in, in, in trying to create that opportunity and benefit for our people, and uh, we want to maintain that opportunity for our people to, to be able to do. And uh, uh, 
the business of the pelts, we're not interested in, you know, I, I used to be in the timber business and in, in the fish business for our tribe and our, in, a, in, our, in the Alaska Corporation. I don't know how many times Senator Stevens took me to task on primary manufacturing, where I'd be sending a log or a, a round fish to, uh, to Asia or somewhere else, and he wanted me to primary manufacture these things. Well, I believe the sea otters give us the opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to primary manufacture those sea otter pellets into products, into personal products, into, uh, into uh, uh, fashion products and, and handicrafts. And we'd like to do that. And I think that could benefit our people. So we're going to oppose any, any idea that these pelts can be sold in raw, sent to Asia, and then come back to us into our tourism market to, to compete with us. We, we don't think that's right. It's not beneficial to the people. The last thing that's a risk to us is, and something that we need help on, well, two things, I, I, I'm not going to be the last thing, two things. Uh, one is uh, that we need help from the, you know, we don't care if you don't have the authority, we we'll want your help. <laughs> it goes like this, you represent the government and then the agencies of the government that have authority over these sea otters are sitting at this table. But we need some help in uh, in understanding the conservation balance between how many sea otters there need to be and then the natural resources that the sea otters feed on and also what we feed on as native people as subsistence. We need to figure out where that balance is. And if you read the, our resolution, which I hope Carrie you've given copies of, uh, we, we see a very complicated language about the optimum balance of how many otters there are, have to be to, to the natural resources. Very complicated statement. Native people think very simply that we need to find a level of balance between the sea otters and their natural foods. And uh, we need to find that, that formula as we look at reducing the numbers of the sea otters. It, you know, there's 20,000 of those things, or 24,000 by 2015. You know, how many can we harvest? Can we shoot and, and reduce 5,000 of them? Can we reduce 6,000 of them? Can we do it over a three-year period, six-year period? We need to understand that before we mobilize our people to undertake this enterprise. And we need science uh, as a part of that equation. We need the the, the biologists uh, understanding, they have to be able to communicate, dialogue with the native community and give us confidence that we're doing the right thing. The reason is, is this is a risk. We watch how you folks manage wolves and you're not doing very well, quite frankly, in terms of the world court of public opinion. And native people do not want, you know, among the battles that we have to do with the bureaucracy to talk about handcraft, how you make them, how we shoot them, uh, how we tag all the risks that we're taking right now with the government, with law enforcement. We certainly don't want to receive, you know, the, the attack from PETA's people and the conservation and environmental community because we engage with the government uh, to, to to move forward on dealing with the sea otters. And so you have to understand, you know, as native leaders, we're concerned about the opinion of, of the PS people and the environmental community. And we do not want to be out of step with them. We certainly want to keep harmony as, as we move forward on the, on the business of dealing with the sea otters. And, 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 and that's a very important point, and I hope that the board and the RAC are listening to us because we don't want to put our people in a bad position as we move forward. The last point, Mr. Chairman, and I know you have the power to do this, uh, and in, in your use of your influence, but we uh, have been working with the Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Forest Service and, and our regional forester and her people 
And the native people have a problem, you know, with the, with the hunting of uh, these sea otters. It costs money for bullets and gasoline. It costs money to ship <coughs> those hides uh, from the hunting grounds to the, the tanneries and then bring them back. And then we have to hold them for a while. That costs money. And then the business of putting them into a handicraft form, which we would like to move into the tourism and personal use and uh, fashion industries as products. All of this is going to cost money. And based upon my years of business experience, this can be a good business, an enterprise. But if the government could help us and they have the ability uh, through the Forest Service has an economic cluster uh, development program. Uh, they have the Rural Development Agency. We have the Small Business Administration and we have the Economic Development Ad Administration. If we could get some help to uh, develop uh, uh, an investment, uh, a business program that will help us facilitate, you know, the hunting of the sea otters and get them to the tanneries and bring them back and make them into products, that, that would be a big help to us. And uh, we certainly have made that uh, request to our regional forester, but with the help of the, the board and our RAC, I, endorsement in that direction would really be good. And my bottom line goal, Mr. Chairman, is to get four sewing machines in each for six communities in Southeast Alaska. And let me tell you, we'll take care of the sea otters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Losher. And I'm going to um, uh, restrict uh, public comments to uh, Mr. Losher's portion with the understanding that we, as a federal subsistence board, have, um, I think, less authority than the, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's, it's an issue that um, is under their jurisdiction. And, um, we as a subsistence board are limited in what we are able to do. I think in some of the wishes that you would love to see, um, <laughs> regulatory and fish and wildlife service has that authority. It does sound like there's some mutual ground that people could share, you know, from, from my understanding to listening to all of the um, information that was put up, up here and listening to the uh, enforcement's um, position. It sounds like there's ways to get people together, and we will leave that with our Fish and Wildlife Service uh, agency. 